we can keep on some sort of a schedule today. Uh, thank you for coming up this afternoon. I don't know what a nice day it is because I've been in here for a while already this morning. If it started to rain or not. I'm Jerry Steffel, the Education Chair here at Intuit, and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce three top Darger Scholars. Everybody has their name tags there, so hey. Um, Dr. James Elledge is the author of the recently published book on Henry Darger that we have here in the bookstore today. And, um, James will be more than happy to sign copies of those. Henry Darger, Throwaway Boy, and he is the director of the MA in Professional Writing Program at Kennesaw State University. Next to Jim is Mary Trent. She's the author of Many Stirring Scenes, Henry Darger's Reworking of American Visual Culture, and is an academic advisor now at the College of uh, Charleston, leaving her assistant professorship job in Wisconsin to be with her husband, finally. <laughs> <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, Chicago's Michael Bonesteel, who authored Henry Darger, Art and Selected Writings. Michael is adjunct assistant professor at the School of the Art Institute uh, of Chicago. So I'd like to welcome all three of you for graciously submitting to being here today. Now, each of you have taken different approaches to the study of Darger. From your personal researched perspective, who was Henry Darger and how should he be remembered um, about five minutes for each of you, and we could begin with Mary. Well, um, first, just I'd like to thank Intuit for having all of us here. Um, yeah. And um, also thank both of you for participating. Um, so I think Henry Darger was someone who lived on society's margins. Um, he worked very hard his whole life um, and had pretty minimal access to socioeconomic power. Um, or freedom, um, including education, um, access to arts institutions, um, and also career opportunities. Um, so that's kind of the sad side of Henry Darker's life, the limited side of his life. But he also was a pretty profound artist. Um, he worked for so many years and produced a very large output. Um, of work which also has really complex references in it. Um, multiple references to different literary sources, historical sources, and also lots of things within visual culture. A broad range of images from magazines and newspapers through decades. Um, so I think the, the interesting story about who Henry Darger was is he's the story of a person who had very limited means, but yet um, created an incredible uh, body of work, working within a harsh environment with limited um, uh, access to power. And I think that's really what you should be remembered for. Okay. Michael? Um, well, discovering who anybody is, um, I think it's a very, very tough and really impossible question to answer because I mean, the, primary question we all ask ourselves is, who am I, you know, where am I going, et cetera. But trying to, we can't even find out the answer to who we are, even ourselves. Um, how do we find out who somebody else is? And then when, when we have someone like Henry Darger, who is somewhat mysterious, um, we don't know a lot about some of the more intimate things in his life. Um, you know, trying to discern who he is uh, is probably, um, very difficult, as I said, question. Um, I'm kind of, and, and the way that the three of us have, have approached Henry Darger, I think because we've approached him from three different <coughs> perspectives, I mean, indicates not only his genius, because he, 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 he embodied so many things and, and elicited so many things from different people that uh, it's, it's a testimony to who he is uh, and, and was. I, I, I'm thinking about this, I was reminded of that analogy or an you know, old story about the three East Indian blind men or come up to an elephant and they're all probing to see what is this, you know, who is this uh, thing in front of us and of course the person in the front says, oh, this, this is a snake, you know, feeling the trunk. Another person in the back feels 
the leg and says, oh, this is a tree trunk. I think that's like that with Darger. We're all going to come up with different, because we're all blind. We, we really don't. We're, we're kind of moving in the dark here. Um, all we have is what Darger gave us, uh, his artwork, his, his, his diaries, his autobiography, his, his writings. Um, to me, what he, his importance is, is, um, is, 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 is his work. His artwork, to me, is, is paramount. Um, I know we're here to discuss Henry Darger's biography, but that's never been particularly my, my bailiwick. I've been interested in the work itself, wanted to base it all on the work, and to me, it was about Henry Darger's search for the grail, his, his, for his search for God, his search for himself, and, and how to overcome his trauma, trauma that he, that he experienced in his childhood, how to grope with that, how to tackle it, and he worked that out creatively in his imagination through a staggering, phenomenal body of work that um, is, uh, I mean, if I, could, if I could wax hyperbolic, I'd say that it's as if William Blake, um, the artist poet, uh, decided to write an epic like J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. I, I think he's monumental in that respect. Um, it's arguable, you know, comparing, you know, those, those three figures, who, who's, who stacks up better or worse than another, but um, I, I think they are all in the same ballpark for many, for many of the same reasons. Thank you. Jim? Thank you. Uh, I agree with both uh, Michael and Mary. Um, without even thinking twice about it. Uh, I think that Darger was a person who was misunderstood in life and after death, both. Uh, and I think that specifically, that despite various obstacles in his life, for example, he was born into utter poverty. Uh, he grew up with a lack of love in terms of family, that sort of thing. Uh, he had a great number of negative, uh, what I call or think of as street experiences. Uh, he was abandoned by his father to the mission and then later on to the asylum. Um, he lacked, um, I, he was educated, but he lacked a, a full kind of uh, extensive education. Uh, he was physically and sexually abused. Um, he was emotionally abused by the nuns when he worked at, at various hospitals. Uh, and at, in the end, uh, his menial jobs uh, were with long hours and very little time off. All these were obstacles for him, and yet, uh, as Michael said, he, he composed this wonderful body of work despite all of that stuff. And uh, for me, it's a triumph of creativity over uh, the kinds of things that he had to face uh, in his life, and not just as a child, but all the way through his life. Okay, Dr. Elledge, your book is the most recent <coughs> series of works that's attempting to uncover who Henry Darger was personally, psychologically, and sexually. To begin, what are the benefits of this kind of research and how, how does it really contribute to the study of Darger? And a second part to that question, what are the drawbacks, if any, from this type of research? Good, good question. Uh, I, I need to start off by saying that I'm not an artist, I'm not an art historian. I basically know nothing about art, although I know what I like when I see it. Um, I have a PhD in English, and my specialization was creative writing. I'm a poet. Um, however, I was trained in what is called close reading, uh, which means that I'm supposed to be, and sometimes I actually am, uh, sensitive to language, uh, the English language in particular. And I began looking at Henry uh, very differently than other people who had written about him before me. I saw Henry as a novelist first, and an artist second, because the art illustrates the novels. And so I wanted to start with the written text and see what the relationship between that and perhaps the art, if possible, but definitely that and his culture, how he grew up, uh, what was going on in Chicago between 1892 and 1973, I believe. 
uh, what was going on and how that might influence him, especially in those wonder years, as TV used to tell us, when he was a kid and uh, a young man trying to figure out life. Uh, for me, um, what I set out to do was to discover the whole man. Okay? Uh, I did want to find out what psychologically he was, what his sexuality might have been, uh, but that wasn't necessarily the only thing. There was always in the back of my mind uh, all of the responses that I had read about uh, when I set out to do the book uh, about him being a pedophile, a serial killer, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I wanted to explore that. Was that a real possibility or was that misunderstanding? Um, so to do all of this, I read all of his written texts. I read a large part of the realms. I've not read the whole thing cover to cover, but I've read a large part of it, thanks to, to Michael's book, uh, in part. Uh, also because I went to the American Folk Art Museum uh, and read large chunks there, but I've read the entire uh, Crazy House cover to cover, and I've read the entire uh, The History of My Life cover to cover. And so uh, for me, it was going in that direction. I also uh, read many, and I've lost track of how many, legal and medical journal articles from the time beginning about 1850 through about 1940 or 50, something like that. Uh, I read a 1,000 page report that was produced uh, because of an investigation that happened at the asylum the year before uh, uh, Darger uh, ran away. Uh, I read all kinds of newspaper articles. Uh, at the University of Chicago, I read over 200 um, first person narratives by gay men in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, I read all kinds of cultural histories and regular histories of Chicago. I read all kinds of books on sex, sexology from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And on top of everything else, as I was talking about just a few minutes ago, I hired a lawyer to sue the state of Illinois for access to Henry's records at the uh, asylum. And it cost $2,500. I got eight sheets of paper for that, and that comes to about $351 and some cents each, okay? Having done all of that, what I was hoping to do, and what I think I did, but you know, time will tell, uh, to discover the human being that Henry was, not the uh, uh, bizarre person that so many people have created him into. Um, the downside to all of that is exactly what Michael said, and that is, we don't really know. And we will never know, okay? All we can do is say, well, from my grasp, it feels like a snake, right? <laughs> um, he's not among us to interview. He left some records. It takes uh, very careful and I think very sensitive reading uh, and that's as good as it gets. Thank you. Mary, do you have a response to that? Yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed reading your book. Um, and I think it, it's important because it, um, it takes, I mean, you know, there had been all this hype historically around the most violent works. Right. And what does that mean? <coughs> what does that tell us about Darger? Um, um, is he pathological? Is he dangerous? What, you know, that had been focused on kind of strongly in some accounts in the past. And so I think your, your, your book um, took, moves away from seeing Darger as pathological. And it also, for me, one thing that was really useful was um, it really gives a vivid sense of Darger's social connections, um, which it also kind of moves his story away from this isolated hermit, which if he was towards the end of his life, he certainly wasn't at earlier stages of his life. So I think your book really opens up alternatives for understanding Darger's identity. Um, I also thought it was really interesting um, how you, you know, traditionally his characters have been described as girls. So describing them as boys identifying as girls is, I think, also really opens up different readings to his paintings and to his, his story. Um, some of the drawbacks, um, as an art historian, um, we try 
not to tie the works so strongly to biography. Biography is obviously an important factor, but I think we, will all, we were all really scarred with Freud's reinterpretation of Leonardo da Vinci um, in terms of just his sexual identity. So, we, you know, um, I think for me, I always try to relate the work to a broader social field. Um, and and I, I think you do that in your book, but um, I also wouldn't want to close down the reading of Darger just to a particular um, part of his biography either. So I, I always want to keep it open. Sure. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, well, I agree with Mary. I, I think that, um, that uh, you know, Jim, you've done an astonishing job of research. Um, I think there are, there are two huge people in this field as far as researchers, and one is John McGregor, and now uh, you've stepped up to the plate on that one. I, I, I think it's um, an amazing job. Um, I think the idea, the theory that you put forth about about Henry Darger being um, gay is one that's not new. It's, it's been around for a while, and I, I, I reviewed your book, and I mentioned Dennis Adrian back in the, uh, the 80s mentioning to me, saying that, well, you know, what's the, what's the big mystery about little girls with penises? There's no mystery here. They're just, they're, they're not little girls, they're little boys in drag. So, you know, that idea has been, but what you did is you took that idea and you ran with it and you researched it um, uh, meticulously. And, and came up with a lot of very persuasive evidence. Um, I think the problem is, 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 for me, is the problem with a lot of psychobiographies, and that is that it, it, it has gone too far. I think that um, the theory is good, the theory is interesting, it's intriguing, um, you, you support it really well, but it remains a theory because there's no conclusive evidence or proof. Now, Everything that you mention is ambiguous, could be taken one way or another. There's, there's nothing there that, that nails it. So, yes, the argument is good, but, it, but there's nothing ultimately convincing about it. And yet, even though that's true, you go on to create literary reenactments that seamlessly flow from your theory into reality, so that when one is reading it, it's, to me it's rather misleading and frankly erroneous because you can't tell where your fictitious reenactment begins and you know, where theory has stopped and what reality really is. So that I found difficult. I don't think it's as, I'll, I'll finish up quickly. No problem. No, 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 I don't think it's as, as, as I've said before here at Intuit in a, in a lecture I gave and in the review, I, I, I don't think it's, it is as damaging as John McGregor's. Um, Having said, he's, he's the great Darger scholar, but his was fatally flawed as well. He, he came up with an uh, idea of, uh, took a Freudian approach, saw Darger as a, as, a, as a serial killer, and proceeded to pound that, the pathological element so strongly that one is left with a damaged view of Darger, which all three of us frankly disagree with. Um, because, because he took it too far, I, I think, he was, he, was, he was well, he was right to bring it up, just as you were right to bring up your theory, but then to go ahead and assume that that was the case and <coughs> act as if it is, um, I think has, the fallout is bad. And as I, as I mentioned, Michael Moon has written a book and has taken some of your ideas and then stated them as if they were fact, that, that Darger and Schloeder were like partners who tried to adopt a child together. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. Um, there's evidence that Darger tried to adopt a child, but nothing, Schloeder's never mentioned in the 30 years of, of research I've done, and I went back and actually re-looked at those documents after I read your book to make sure that I didn't overlook something, and I, I still found nothing. So, um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So let's continue, uh, Michael, with some of this. You spent a significant amount of time with the writing of Henry Darger and are working on a new book, uh, in regard to the writing, and it's going to be shorter than 15, 16,000 pages. To, I just want to make everybody aware of that. But tell us a little bit more about that research with his writing, and has anything <coughs> Jim has written altered your opinion of how you might be approaching Darger? Um, well, in terms of doing the research uh, for the Darger writing, there's 
I spent much of our breakfast telling you about it, and, I, and it's like it's like I go, I, I yeah, I could go on about that, and I and I, and I really don't want to take up too much time with that. It, it's um basically what this what this book project will do. It's it's not so much of a abridgment of those fifteen thousand pages, as it is a a highlight, a re chronologizing, if that's a word, and a trying to put it all in a more chronological order according to theme is what I'm doing. So I'm reordering it. I'm, re I'm, I'm reordering both the way it was presented and, and as well as what's presented. And yet I'm, I'm trying to follow roughly in the same direction mm -hmm. Darger was moving, but just pulling things from different areas where it was, where it was necessary. For example, when, he, when the Vivian girls were introduced, we hardly he, he hardly talks anything about the Vivian girls in the beginning in, in the beginning of the story. It's all about their parents, or mainly I mean his basically their their uncle and father, and then it goes to John Evans, their their guardian. He spends a lot of time with that, and then it goes on to Blenkins. The Vivian girls are never really explored very thoroughly until we move into the story deeper. So I took things from different air places where I thought we, things that really sort of explicated who the Vivian girls were, put them all into one place, and then moved on to um, Jack Evans, took different histories of him from different parts of, of, the, of the saga, put them all in one place, but then still tried to follow some of the things that, that did seem to flow um, from that. So that's roughly an idea. Um, this will be two to three volumes, um, if the first volume <coughs> doesn't help. Um, each volume will be about 250 pages. It might only be two volumes. I don't know. Um, I, I've still got a lot more to, uh, work to do on it, but um, uh, it should be uh, should be appearing sometime late next year, early in 2015. Um, uh, what has Jim done that's that's affected me? Well, there were several areas that I was astonished to read. A couple of things, um, and one of them I think I, I I contacted you about because I wanted to know about. Um, the Anne Emmerich ep episode, the Christian Catholic Christian saint who uh, is revealed in, in, in the Darger book uh, to um, in the realms of the unreal. You mentioned that that that, that Darger appropriated as he did so appropriate all over the place. He appropriated something from Anne Emmerich about Christ being flogged and his mother Mary, Christ's mother Mary, witnessing Christ having an erection. Well, when I read that, I was flabbergasted because Darger rarely, he's, he certainly has no, he's not squeamish about violence or, or anything. And he, he does indulge in heavy eroticism, heavy petting, heavy make-out scenes. But I have never seen anything, even the mention of the word penis or the mention of anything that overt. So I, I contacted him and asked him, where is this? Where does this take place? I need to go. And, and I have not read the realms that closely yet. I'm, I'm still working on most of it, but I don't remember having come across that. And you could not provide me with an answer to that. So um, that I would love to nail down. Um, and the other thing that I think has, uh, I, it's not my a project now, but maybe another project down the line, if this realms project is good, we may move on to to further adventures in, in Chicago crazy, crazy House. And there is a scene that you mentioned, um, and I have not read, I've read very little of that, um, where uh, Angeline does the Highland Fling mm -hmm. and uh, does a, I don't know if you imply it's a striptease or what, what kind of a dance it is, but she winds up sitting on the laps of the various male clientels in this, <coughs> in this uh, uh, it wasn't a burlesque house, but it was some sort of a, a vaudeville stage a vaudeville. of some yeah. sort. Yeah. Um, that, I, that, so, is there implied lap dancing going on here? Was there implied prostitution? I mean, you mentioned prostitution as being a, a, a very strong possibility. That, I mean, again, now this is a later book. Darger has, maybe he's graduated from eroticism to overt sexuality in Crazy House, which is very interesting um, that he was a, uh, that he progressed in that in that way, but anyway, those are those are things that I really am grateful that you brought those up and, and, and were eye openers to me. So, okay, thank you, Michael.
Mary, what about um, your own inquiry into darker? Okay. Um, well, so in, in my research, um, I have one article that has been published. It was published in 2012. And I think that, that article overlaps with some of the work that you've done and it's the kind of questions it asks. Um, I, I looked at that in some of the most controversial images um, that have kind of, kind of received the most hype um, just in reviews and the popular press, um, the most violent images, um, also question, you know, the issue McGregor brings up about Darger potentially being um, a pedophile or a child murderer. And what I really wanted to do in that was to set um, these disturbing images for us, images that read as disturbing in our current, you know, for us, um, into the context of the sex crime panic in the 1940s and the 1950s. And I also wanted to, I, for me, what's always interesting in Darger is the sources that he uses and how he changes them in his works. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have the time to really go through all of his sources at the American Folk Art Museum and to some extent also here at Intuit. Um, and while doing that, I found that um, in Crazy House, um, he references a lot of stories from the mass press in the 40s and the 50s around these sensationalized murders of children um, that were really sort of um, uh, hyped up in the press um, in order, well, one, uh, with the FBI to increase the FBI's jurisdiction and power for um, persecuting outsiders, um, including homosexuals. Um, and, you know, I think Darter was always very sensitive to um, how outsiders were viewed in society and the fears around their potential to hurt people, to hurt children. When he was institutionalized, um, it wasn't sex psychopaths that were the target, um, as it was in the 40s and 50s. It was morons. It was the feeble-minded. And morons were the highest functioning class of the feeble-minded at the turn of the century, which is what Darger would have been described as in, in the institution. So he himself, even as a child, most likely, would have been seen as someone who endangered other children. Um, also being, you know, a potential delinquent, or at least a, a poor urban youth um, living, um, coming from a family with an immigrant father. Um, he was also just a part of that um, socially marginalized community that was feared, and it was often a scapegoat for larger social concerns. So um, I think he kept a, a sensitivity um, towards um, the way towards social scapegoats throughout his life and kind of was working through that in these these images. I, um, and I think that kind of helps to take us away from the, um, McGregor's reading that these are kind of like illustrations of a private fantasy. I don't think that's what they are. I mean, they're, they're dealing with broader social issues that he was personally aware of um, because he had been subject to uh, persecution around them. I don't think they were fantasies of things that he wanted to do. Um, I also, in that, in that article, talked about just issues of masculinity and femininity. <coughs> I mean, I think one of the great things about his work is that it moves away from kind of ideals of heroic masculinity in the mass press that he drew from for his sources. He, he messes everything up, right? He uses images of cowboys and soldiers, but they become these horrible child killers, right? They're the predators, not um, the morons. They're the people who are hurting children. And then the innocent girls, or boys, I guess, um, uh, are actually these really powerful fighters who are also deviants because they're girl boys or boy girls. They are the outsiders. You know, the, the victims become the outsiders in his work, um, really challenge our ideas of gender norms. Um, and he does that all through working with mass media. So he takes these idealized pictures of girls from advertisements, from coloring books, and then turns them into these deviants in his work who are actually the heroes of his story. So for me, so that, that, that publication um, is part of a larger book project that is currently under peer review. Um, and in that larger project, um, I look at a number of different um, ways that he's transformed mass media in his works and to really kind of think about how he comments on the broader American society that he lived in um, and how he offers up us an alternative image of the 20th century American experience. And so um, 
you know, I found there were a lot of passages in your book that are going to be useful for my research too. Um, you know, I, I hadn't really thought that much about how, about um, sort of the historic view of um, homosexuality as men considered feminine, you know, pre-Stonewall. Um, and, you know, I really want to think more about the, um, these boy girls in Darger's work um, and, and uh, uh, different possibilities for what that might have uh, read to him as and how that might have connected with different changing ideas about masculinity and femininity. Um, I never had thought before of the Vivian girls' names as sort of queer pseudonyms. So that was, um, like, I, I, I think that was an interesting possibility. I'm not sure if I'm completely convinced <laughs> that, it, that um, okay. it's the only thing he was thinking about in those names, but that kind of blew my mind thinking about that. That was, that was very difficult for me. Um, and then also, I mentioned to this to you before, but uh, with me being really interested in the mass media that he works with, I've always kind of wondered where does he get it from, and people before had written about his you know, dumpster diving, and that's where he got all of his sources. And you talk about how um, working in the hospitals, of course, he would have had access to newspapers and magazines that people would have just left behind, and so that, that was kind of an interesting uh, connection for me as well. Okay, thank you, Michael. Do you have anything to add? Just to the coming from yours? Okay. Mary, you've used Henry Darger's work to draw, address really broad social issues about identity and gender. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your own scholarship? You hit on it a little bit before, and I would like to pinpoint maybe more if you've made any connections with the sex crimes that were sensationalized in the 40s and 50s. Yeah, so I actually jumped ahead. I answered this question just thinking that we were already on that. That's why you had the sex crimes. I thought I'd spice it up a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's in Crazy House, there's um, like just like he talks about, you know, these there's the murders that take place in this house. Um, and there's this one girl that gets murdered in the house, um, Paulinia. And there are all these little details that he includes in the story of like, how you know they tracked down the gas man who came to you know check the, the gas in the basement um, by a candy wrapper that was left in in the house, and that's how they found the gas man who was the guy who killed Paulinia in the house, and that she'd been strangled with a sash cord um, uh, after she was raped, and um, although actually he doesn't include the word rape in the story, but there are this was a sensationalized murder that happened in New York, um, um, Paul Paula. And it's like very similar language. The, a candy wrapper was found in the basement used to find the killer who was a gas man, or who was a, somebody else who masqueraded as a gas man in order to get into the basement and kill this girl. Um, and there was also a sash cord, like a hair tie, used to strangle her. So, and this, this was in like, um, J. Edgar Hoover published this whole series of articles in American Magazine, which Darger read, that, um, you know, had these, very scary photos in them of this giant hand coming down to attack little, you know, blonde little girls running and screaming. Um, and he used clippings from stories like this that were already out there and circulated broadly anyway, but to, to really scare people about um, seeming, you know, about um, isolated men on streets who are endangering your children as they come home from school. And you know, Darger probably was reading these articles because he he had, he read American Magazine in the same years as they came out. Even though I wasn't able to find any of the art, the this any of the FBI's articles in his sources, I think it was probably pretty likely that he read them. And he definitely quotes from them. He uses them. He cites them in his um, in his sequel. Okay. Thank you. Now, for all three of you, what in your opinion? is the most useful aspect of the study of Henry Darger? And why is it important that we continue this type of research? Jim, would you like to start with that? I think probably, at least from my point of view, uh, the most important thing is to remain objective, not let uh, a knee-jerk reaction get into the researcher's uh, uh, consciousness. Uh, we need to keep from that because that's what got him uh, labeled with all kinds of very negative kinds of things. So I think that's uh, really, really important. Um, secondly, I think 
that uh, we need to continue doing research that will uh, deal into his humanity. Uh, because he was a human being, and he was a very complicated, complex individual, and his artwork is just as complex as he is in the long run. Um, I think it's really great that Michael's going to be, or hopes to be, or at least I hope he will, uh, deal with Crazy House, because it is in Crazy House where I found so much of the sexuality. Uh, I was... Uh, when I first started the book, I wasn't sure where to go with it, and I emailed McGregor, and he did not want to talk to me, and I understood that perfectly, but he said, read Crazy House. And I did, and it's, it's amazing what is in it. Uh, my book only uh, grazes the, the very uh, surface of all the stuff in it, so I'm, I hope you come out with that, because that's really a fabulous book. Okay, Michael. Um, well, uh, even if you could address a little bit more with Crazy House. Yeah. yeah. Well, that that when I met with my editor uh, in New York this, this summer, that that idea of doing Crazy House just came up out of the blue, just as, as a one-word thing, in, in, with the idea of saying that, well, if the first book, book does well and we can go on to finish Realms, there might be more there. There might be like perhaps we could do Crazy House. And I thought, oh, that's that's great. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it too. I, um, I think, you know, in terms of um, what to, the most important things for me um, in terms of research of, of Darger, and we talked about this between us earlier today, is, is what, what was really um, behind this project, this abridgment project, 10 years ago when I first, I mean, even before I did, my book in 2000, I wanted to do an abridgment. I wanted to do, I wanted to connect the writing and the art. I wanted to have a gigantic multi-volume encyclopedia that would have all the writing, all the art, and connect it all up. And we talked about getting a team of writers together and, and bringing various scholars in. And of course, over the years, we realized how grandiose and idealistic and, and, and totally um, how it would never happen, <laughs> you know, even, even now. Uh, who's going to fund such a thing? Um, we're closer now to maybe than we've ever been, and yet we're still far away from, from really any kind of money being, uh, you know, coming up for that. So in, in lieu of, of not doing anything at all, um, it was fine. We, we, this, this project that I'm working on now has been about the <coughs> third or fourth proposal that was finally accepted, and, and it's just me doing it because... You know, we, we, we exhausted every other possibility we could think of. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to still be involved after all, all this time. Uh, but uh, I think the important things really is, 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 is still connecting, first of all, finding a chronology of the artwork. What was done first? I mean, we can guess at a lot of that uh, by style. But really, the research needs, needs to be done to really figure out what decades these each, each of the the bodies of artwork were done, and then we can and then the second thing would be to sync them up with episodes of the realms. And there's only going to be a certain very small percentage of artwork done that corresponds to the realms. A lot of it was done. Uh, uh, he took off with an idea, but then by the time he was done with the piece, it bared no resemblance to what what was inspiring it. So we can't find the connection anymore. Um, with the later work, there is no connection. Uh, it's, it was all the artwork was done, not anchored to any writing at all. It was done. He was doing that totally as an artist. He was in his mature period of, of, of just creating these baroque fantasies of repetitious girl imagery in his fantasy world, where the, the old dragon blankets had been totally transformed into ram-headed uh, little girls that looked just like the child slaves. It's a whole new transformed world that does not connect with, with the literature. Um, Crazy House, I think that one image of, of the hand coming down might be related. Mm -hmm. There's a few other pieces that seem to relate to Crazy House, but if we do that, we're there, I don't know, we're going to have to come in to just do little details from the older work uh, to, to just, you know, uh, illustrate it because there's really no correspondence there. But anyway, those, those are, to me, those are the things that need to be done, is to really, really have a, ideally, um, over the years, there will be scholars that are going to 
map all this out, and there's a, there's a gigantic project of decades long for those who are willing to do so. Uh, and uh, she, I think I'll be gone. Mary, you'll be around, but uh, I'll be <laughs> long gone. I, we'll, be, uh, we'll be looking looking at it from the uh, from the other side, saying, "Go, guys!" And, yeah, that's right. Okay, Mary. So it's up to you now. Yeah. Um, it's all my <laughs> I'd like you just to talk a little bit about your new publication that it's not published yet, but it's coming because it's in peer review right now. Yeah. But if you could just talk about that and how that research has led you to some of the conclusions that you made with uh, sure. this new piece. I mean, um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about Darger today is that um, he's kind of an early predecessor for how I think so many people work with media today. Um, he remixes things, he samples things, he poaches things. Um, so many people today um, can create really interesting things and um, share them with others without going to art school. Not that there's anything wrong with going to art school, going to art school is awesome. But so many people have access to reworking media today without having to go through an institution and get trained um, in traditional techniques. And, you know, and that's just one more way of creating things today in a world that's awash in visual culture, right? So he did that um, a long time ago. He started that at the beginning of the 20th century um, and then did it for decades as visual culture changed. Um, so I think, I mean, that's something that, that I've always tried to figure out about him. It's like, well, what was he doing? Let's look at him in that way. Let's look at him through that perspective of knowing how people work with, with media today and see how he was doing a pre-digital era with paper, right? Um, and, also, and how he, he poaches from sort of, sort of the seemingly all-powerful realm of mass media to create alternative images that go against the grain. So that's really what you know. What my book has been about is looking at at, at how he does that with different subjects in his work. Um, I think, um, and I was able to do that through spending a fair amount of time going through his paintings and finding the sources. You know, I, like really taking really good photos and organizing them in databases and figuring out how to match them to the many photos of sources that I took. But we were just talking about earlier today how there's still like all these stacks and stacks and stacks of material here at Intuit twined up that hasn't ever been opened. And who knows what's in those stacks? Like not just all the clippings, but drawings, more tracings of things that maybe we recognize from the paintings if we've been looking at the paintings regularly. So there's, I mean, there's so much more that I think can be figured out about the work by going through more of that material. Um, and again, digital tools can really help that. A huge amount of my research was thanks to the fact that Google has Life Magazine and lots of other magazines online searchable. So I could type in some text that I thought, this doesn't sound like Darga, this sounds like he got it from an article somewhere into Google and find the life article where he got it from without having to go through, you know, stacks of magazines in the library. So, I mean, I think there's interesting ways that darker and research and digital tools can kind of all come together in the next few decades to help us see things that, that we haven't been able to see in the work so far. Thank you. And Jim, I'm just interested in the <coughs> correlation between the new book that you're working on about gay life in Chicago from 1842 on, and the correlation with your book, you know, it probably started here and has led as you did archival research. So I wonder if you could just address that a little bit. Oh, sure. Everybody. Um, because I read so much about uh, sexuality in the 1800s and the early 1900s, especially here in Chicago, uh, I had a lot of junk lying around, very much like Darger <laughs> himself, right? It was all digitalized, it's all on my laptop, and so I decided that I was not going to just ignore that, that I could sit down and write another book, not about Darger, but about the time in which he lived, pretty much. And uh, I discovered the first uh, reference, I believe, uh, at least at this point, it appears to me to be the first of gay, uh, the possibility of gay men being in Chicago 
1842. And just to kind of round it all out, I decided I would start there and end in 1942, which was uh, right around the same time as what is uh, often called the Lavender Scare. Uh, and so that's what I intend to do. And a lot of, of what I found uh, has been newspaper articles. There's tons of, of very amazingly interesting and bizarre and um, unforgettable things that went on in Chicago uh, in the 1800s. You would be amazed. So buy my book and you'll see all those fun things uh, if it ever gets published. Um, but a lot of it came out of uh, my work at the University of Chicago. As I said earlier, they have these fabulous first-person narratives by gay men of a variety of ages, uh, mostly white, mostly middle class, uh, talking about how they grew up and what they did for fun and where they did it and with whom and all kinds of things, what they did for a living. Um, it's amazing, and it's all right there at the University of Chicago, and it's from the 1920s and 30s, basically. Uh, and so that's what I, I hope to do. I, I've never, uh, I've talked to my, uh, the publisher of this book. I had several ideas uh, that I wanted, uh, that I could have gone into to write the next book, and he wanted me to do that. So I'm hoping that they will go ahead and take that book on. I mean, you never know. Right. You know, from one to the other, you just simply don't know. But that's what I'm doing. I've got about 100 pages written already. It's almost ready uh, to go to uh, my editor to say, uh, take this or don't take it, but let me know. Thank you. We'd like to open up uh, the panel to any questions <coughs> that you might have about Henry Darger or their research. Yes. I just have a general question um, regarding Doc Darger's solitude. Now, he died, what, 73? And he was already becoming famous by about 1980, am I right? I mean, he was known. Not in, famous, no. But in Chicago. He was, he was emerging then, yeah. yeah. In Chicago, he, was, he would have been heard about, right? <laughs> Did anybody come forward to say, hey, I used to drink with Henry, or I you hang out with him at the church? Because to my knowledge, nobody has come forward at any time since his death saying, yeah, I hung out with Henry. I have a great anecdote. Probably have, we probably all have some. This one I don't think, I've never heard anybody say this one before, so here you go. <laughs> um, I found someone, I went on Ancestry.com, anyone gone on there? I have. To see yeah. if, were there any documents about Darger on there? And there was someone who had created a family tree for Darger on Ancestry.com, so I thought, who, who did this? And I got in touch with them, and it was the, I'm not gonna remember this perfectly, like granddaughter of the, the owners of the house before the law. Oh, Gear, G E H R was Mary, her name. Mary yeah. McDonald. Mac no. McDonald, I think her name was. Uh, Mary something. Yeah, Gear's daughter, mm -hmm. the one who grew up with Darby. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but it, um, <coughs> it wasn't her who had created the family chair, it was okay. someone else. But anyway, I got in touch with, um, with them over the phone, actually, and talked with them, and they talked about how when they were all living in that house, um, a very, uh, an uncle of Orson Welles actually lived on the same floor of uh, Darger. I don't know if you've heard this before. And he was really quirky too, apparently. Um, and the Orson Welles would come to the flats and take him out drinking, and they would come back. Orson Welles took Darger on? Not Darger. Okay. Wouldn't that be one? But the other bachelor lived in the building. And, and so, at that time, there there was a quirky atmosphere, at least among those those two people. And, the, <coughs> and he talked about how, um, at the winter, the the guy would like stand on the balcony and put a tea kettle on his head, and then pour hot water over to passersby who would walk by, and the darker would laugh at that, and the darker thought that was really funny, and so there was sort of a mutual quirkiness and appreciation <laughs> among those two people who lived there. So um, I mean, again, this is. You know, memories from decades before, which I'm not remembering correctly, and I don't have my notes with me from that conversation a few years ago. But I think there are there are stories of people who remember Darger. Um, I mean, there, there are people from the church who remember him. Jessica used yeah. film, like, mm -hmm. yeah. interviews many of those exactly. people. You know, the, the, the altar boy who mm -hmm. knew him. 
uh, nobody from the cafe where he went, you know, to eat, but uh, <coughs> that's mentioned in there. So yeah, it was, you know, there's plenty of, plenty of evidence about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. I have sort of a, a I had a different question, but a follow-up. <coughs> so, I mean, the notion we have of Darger is him of just being this sort of isolated hermit toward the end of his life, but then is there evidence that he had, like, it kind of blows my mind to think that he had friends when he was younger and like a crowd, but I don't know. I don't know what evidence there is of that, um, or if any of you guys know anything about that. But my other question had to do, in all my reading about Darger, there's, is there any evidence that he ever tried to show his work to anybody? Did he ever send his manuscript to New York to a publisher? Did he ever try to, I know he wasn't you know, in a writing group or anything like that, but did he, you know. Good, um, good thing, too. Did he, did, he ever, did he ever try to show his work to anybody? Well, Jim, you could maybe. Because yeah. that's because that's something in your book. My, my assumption is that he would have shown it to uh, William Willie. Okay, I mean they were very close. I think they were partners, and so that would make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, David Berglund, who was a neighbor, mentions in several places that I've read that uh, he had seen artwork on Darger's table. Uh, Kyoko Lerner says in one place, maybe it's uh, McGregor's book, that she saw uh, Darger working on uh, a piece and said, Darger, you're an artist, or you're a good artist, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Darger said, yes, I am. Um, he did, uh, I've uncovered in a letter he wrote to uh, one of the nuns at St. Joseph's Hospital, Sister Rose, he wrote to her about uh, what I uh, about um, one of his books, and I assume at that point it would have been the realms. Uh, he talked. He's he disguised it though because he showed it to his roommate Thomas Felon back in 1910 or so, and Felon uh, tossed it out, threw the first version away, and so Darger had to rewrite it. Uh, so he talks to, in 1917, uh, wrote a letter to Sister Rose and said that he was working on a piece about a Catholic lodge, which I assume was the Gemini, the uh, Children's Protective Association, or, or whatever he called it, that he and Willie evidently uh, created, maybe fictitiously or maybe in reality. Uh, so I think, I think he was probably very guarded. But he did. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was only in very kind of um, uh, cloaked kinds of ways. Uh, I think after Bellin uh, threw the manuscript away uh, and, and called him names that Darger said were slanderous, uh, that uh, he was uh, shy about letting other people uh, read it, as, as anyone uh, is in the early stages of writing. I mean, that's just very typical. Uh, as a teacher of creative writing, I realize you have to be very careful, and I'm sure teachers of art have to do this too, about how you approach a, a young person who is just learning how to write or paint or whatever. You've got to be very careful so that you can give the critical um, uh, direction that they need, uh, but not uh, squash their creativity. Mm -hmm. Okay, And I think that's what happened. I think people didn't realize, and I think they were they were ended up kind of uh, squashing his creativity in a way, and so he pulled away from that. Mm -hmm. Darker got his revenge by uh, naming the yes, one of the did. villains, yes, Eleni of Tamerlane, who uh, who then becomes one of the assassins of, of the child martyr, and uh, it yeah. is also accused of stealing his manuscript. Yes, you yes. know the manuscript that exists both in the real world and the realms in this you know, parallel situation. And but he talks you, about it in his journal, so that's how I know about that. The other thing, though, that, that he did do is, um, as, as I, I think both of you know, that he sent, there is a document in, the, in his material, in, his, in, his, uh, in the archives, where he received a letter from a song poem uh, organization, where he apparently had sent some lyrics to a song poem uh, organization, uh, hoping that they would set it to music, and that uh, possibly he would become, you know, like uh, a published uh, 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 songwriter. Uh, but of course, it was you know these things were somewhat 
<coughs> like they are today, scams where they say, Absolutely. oh sure, we will add, we'll, we're happy to put this to, <laughs> no matter how wonderful or terrible it is, we'll happy to put it, it just costs you so much money, you just send us $100 and we'll you know, do it up for you. Of course, I don't think he ever followed up on that. Yeah. So Can you draw this face on the back of this matchbook? Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. exactly. But he writes, just in this writing, that one day great editors will go through yes. my works and realize and there you go. that we've had it going on right now. He was pro -life. Yeah, but I've tried to figure that thing out too, you know, just like what, like, what did, what was his social life really like when he was younger? Um, and I mean, I think he's, he, I mean, he definitely was around people, you know, yeah. he had friends when he was younger, I mean, that's evident. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think he isn't uh, fully capable of <laughs> describing his emotions. I think that's one of his weaknesses, like he's so skilled in his artwork, um, but like actually grasping like descriptions of emotions in his autobiography. Yeah. And then Absolutely. even I think in his novel, he often cribs from other people's writings in emotional scenes and scenes where you're getting into someone's head. So I don't, I don't think that was a strength for him. I think he really struggled with that, which um, I would imagine would translate into his relationships with people too, that he struggled with interpersonal emotions. Judy, you had a question. Yes, okay. Uh, my question will, will reveal my lousy knowledge of history. What were the war years? Which war? Uh, One? Two. World War Two? Yes. We entered it in 41 and started in 45? 45? Yes, 42 something like 45 that. 45 for us. Okay. Okay. And so how, how does that relate to his uh, time period of storytelling and drawing? Does it at all? That's the big question, right? Like what works was he making? The yeah. I mean, he was definitely making making works. Yeah. Because you can see, we talked about this earlier, the army, the soldiers that were cut out and collaged onto some of the uh, artworks. Well, uh, he was living in, in, a, in a place owned by a couple who were Jewish. And um, I, I mean, I, I just wonder if you've ever thought about how, if at all, this, uh, I, I'm sure it was all over the newspapers all the time, but the, uh, the, the oppression and uh, people killed and so forth and so forth, I just wonder if you feel that there was any relationship there. I think if there was, it was prescient. I think he was, he anticipated the Holocaust by decades. Um, he anticipated ch children, you know, um, put into armies, you know, by decades. What's interesting is that the first concentration camps in his art are look like ranch scenes, with little, nice little, uh, you know, like um, wooden fences. But then the later artwork, you have the barbed wire. But I mean, he was making probably by World War II. He was probably done with the realms, writing the realms. Not, not necessarily making illustrations. He might still have been illustrating it a little bit. Okay. Um, but 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 World War One was really the war that he was he was firmly um, that was that was happening simultaneous to his first writing. Okay. Realms. And we have to remember too that he was drafted into the army for exactly. World War One, mm -hmm. uh, and so that might have been partially why that happened. Yeah. That awareness. He was in, did he, did he oh, go into the army? Did he serve? Yeah. Not he went to camp, uh, like no camp, and he was he was uh, discharged. Um, he, do we know he, why he was discharged? He pretended to have really bad eyesight, far worse than what he actually had, and they discharged him honorably. Um, Nikki, so I, got I was just wondering if you think that he was aware enough of the world in the outside view that if he had submitted at least some of the artwork that he probably would have gotten himself into a lot of trouble in the post, particularly post-World War II era where we were looking for deviants and yeah, communists right. and stuff everywhere. I mean, might that be part of the reason that he s sat on things? So and cloistered. Yeah. Well, I just, I don't think he fit into the social context of the art exhibiting scene. Like, I don't think, I mean, I don't think that was his audience. And I don't know if he, I mean, he 
wanted he wanted it published as a book with illustrations. Mm -hmm. Like his idea of fame was that it would come through through that. Like that, I mean, he loved st story books. Mm -hmm. He loved Frank Baum and the Wizard of Oz books. I think he saw himself more as like like um, Frank Baum and a, a really incredible illustrator of the Wizard. Of Oz, you know, then. Mm -hmm you know, like, um, I don't know, Jackson Pollock or something. Like, I don't think that was his theme. But would he have, no, if he had sent that to a publisher, mm -hmm. yeah. I think he would have been in a lot of trouble. Not if he had taken the work to art galleries. There was all kinds of crazy work in the 20th century. Well, no, but I'm, she's saying he wasn't taking the work Well, I know that, but you're saying, well, you're Sorry. Just, I mean, just in terms of visual art, there was all kinds of crazy stuff from the beginning of the 20th century. I remember Salvador Dali was a contemporary of he was aware that, that he was doing somewhat deviant work because when he was having the photographs blown up, he would cover up the genital area mm -hmm. and, and give it to, when he, when he gave it to uh, the photographer to have a, he would, trace, he would trace a photograph that might have had a penis on it originally and he wanted a larger, larger version, but he covered it up with a fake skirt and gave it to him. So he, he, he was conscious okay. that, that, that what he was doing was not... But I also think he was, at the same time, he was very rec reclusive, and this was not about public display at all. I don't think he, I don't, and the idea that he wanted to be published, I think, is still somewhat theoretical, um, because he, yes, he does in his book say, editors of the visual, look at the, and he says, and he's always sort of, he's, he says, dear, he addresses the reader, my dear reader. So there he is a constant, but are these devices that he would have read other authors doing, and, and in his, fantasy, in his role of a fantasy author, this is just what you do if you're writing, but did, was, did he really mean to have it published or wanted to see it published? This is the big question. We don't know. I don't think we really know. Well, this is something, too, where I think um, McGregor does get some, something, right, something really useful. He talks, about, he talks about how Henry, like, feeling really prideful about his uh, writing skills. And so I think at least when he started the novel, like I think things changed over time. Like I don't think he would have pu tried to publish Crazy House. I think he definitely self-censored with that one. Oh, yeah. But I think when he first started writing um, The Realms, they have these really elaborate intros that really are right. giving instructions to the reader, like here's how you should read my book. Like here's how you should identify with the characters. Like identify with the bad guys, but then identify with the good guys. And you know, here's how the novel is gonna take you through this story. So I think that, I mean, that is also partly just a community writing device for yourself to imagine an imaginary reader, even if you never actually want one. But um, I think he was, I think there was a great pride in his seeing himself mm -hmm. as, as a writer, as mm -hmm. like Frank Baum. Um, and so I do think he, especially at the beginning, he did think of it as a real possibility. And he kind of at least played with that idea of fame that, I mean, most artists, even if they don't show their work, kind of that's, that can be inspirational on some level, just for having the gifts that you see in yourself be recognized by others. Like, I think that was part of what inspired him at the beginning. Okay. What kind of work was Nathan doing at the time? What kind of artwork was he, in, was he doing? Well, you know, Nathan came in pretty late in the picture. He was mid fifties when he. Nineteen thirty seven. Yeah, when he yeah. when he, when he was 1957 before Nathan entered into Darger's life. So prior to that, he had a previous, a different landlord. Prior to that, he lived in a, in a hospital. Oh, uh, that's he, true. So Nathan, the learners came in really at the very end. If you really okay, look at I, uh, I didn't realize that. Okay, so no influence, uh, knowing about creating art. Something. Well, of course, the great thing is that Nathan was an artist who recognized it and, and preserved it. Oh, yeah. That, okay. that is the, the miracle. Yeah. Right. There. Bill? So, Jim, I, I'm only about 80 pages into your book, so you may get back to this later. But in, in, the, in the part I've read, you referenced that, that there were clearly cousins laying around. The um, question is whether, and I've wonder, often wondered about this, whether any of the cousins' descendants have ever stepped forward and or has anyone ever tried to track down and yeah. send it to something? Because um, I scratched my head over that for a long time. Right. Because he clearly had relations. It's curious that no relations have ever surfaced. Right. He, uh, he has third and at least four cousins who are still alive. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever stepped forward. I have no clue about that. 
Uh, I was able to track them down by using um, Ancestry.com. Uh, it's all right there uh, in all of the, uh, the census data. Uh, I, I don't know if so anyone you have it, so no, you're not aware of anyone who ever has. Yeah, but it's, it's available. But you also mentioned that the name's not the same anymore. Oh, the names are They're not the male same. Male descendants, it's female descendants. Yes. Uh, the, the, from uh, Darger's family, he had two uncles, uh, one of whom had uh, children who had children who had children, uh, but they were almost always girls. Uh, and so the, the names right now are not Darger at all. So it's possible they may not know they're related. My guess is they don't know. So you know. Unless you go back, uh, one of them would go back and try to track their, their family back. Uh, there, there would be no reason for them to even dream that they were related to it. Be an interesting confrontation. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I hate to sound totally cynical, uh, including because it, it, it reflects on folks in the room, but um, no one who <coughs> worked with the Darger materials any, would have any real interest in tracking down family members because of the legal consequences they could have for access to material. I mean, it's obviously Kyoko Lerner has no interest in finding Henry. Nor do people in the Kyoko's good graces to work on it. So, no, no shock that, that there hasn't been a, a dragnet put up for them. But I'm just curious. And the up, but the up, build the upshot. I mean, it's it's all about money and greed in the end. You know, so what what good would it be for anybody? Yeah, and I yeah, and I wouldn't I wouldn't yeah, I don't necessarily dispute that. I, I, I yeah. get it. Okay. just it's just an observation. <laughs> Do you have a question? Um, were both of his parents immigrants, and do you know where they came from? Yes, they, uh, Darger's father was from Germany. Uh, he moved from Germany to London uh, early on, uh, married a woman, had a first wife before Darger's wife, or Darger's mother, I should say. Uh, they moved to the U.S. She died. Uh, a few years later, he met uh, Rosa, or Rosie, uh, and married her. She evidently, um, according to some documents, came from Wisconsin. I've been unable to find anything at all about her, and I've been uh, all over uh, census reports and everything I could find, uh, and could find nothing about her at all. She evidently, at least according to um, uh, McGregor, had, uh, and in fact, I know this is true because I've seen uh, some of the, the census and other things. She had three children before she married uh, uh, Henry's father. Uh, they were married. I think McGregor says at one point that he wasn't sure if uh, the parents had been uh, married or not, but I found their, their uh, a marriage certificate, their wedding certificate, so they were married. Um, uh, but. As far as uh, that goes, I, that's as far back as I was interested or willing to go. I didn't really care about going way back into Germany and finding out whatever. Would you have guessed they spoke German in the house? No, they didn't. Okay. Uh, Darger says at one point that he was uh, um, uh, upset. I don't know if that's the right word, but he was sad, I suppose, that his father never taught him German. So I'm assuming then that the father spoke English in the house. Any other questions? Okay. Um, we never did settle. Is it Darger? Or yeah, Darker? that's that was going to be Which is <laughs> always an interesting uh, something to talk about. Uh, there are our new uh, Outsider magazines up there. The Visionary Ball is coming up <coughs> next events. They're all on the round table, so please take them. And I'd like to thank our panel. And Jim has copies of his books that he'll be happy to sign. Do you want to do that in here? Or? Uh, yeah, I think they usually have a table out there. Out there okay, yeah. great. Thank you, you for just that in the bookstore with Heather. Mm -hmm.